Today, we're diving deep into the incredible power of your mind and how it could be affecting your health in ways you might not even realize. I want you to understand that your mind is a potent force, and if left unchecked, it could be making you sick. So we're going to explore how to take control before it's too late. So let's get started. The elevated emotion is the key, my friends. It's the carrier of your thoughts. Picture it like this. All energy, every frequency carries information. The faster the frequency, the higher the energy. Combine that with an elevated emotion and a clear intention. It's like firing up a laser. Why? Because you're creating a more coherent signature, a powerful force that can influence your reality. We've measured this. And guess what happens when people have a coherent brain and heart? Magic unfolds in their lives. But it's not just about feeling gratitude. It's about combining that elevated emotion with a clear intention. This combination is the game changer. We've seen it in experiments and the results are mind blowing. Think of your mind as a radio dial. It's all about vibration, it's all about energy. When there's a vibrational match between your energy and the potential in the quantum field, something extraordinary happens. It finds you. But it all starts with intention. Get clear on what you want. Let's say it's a new home or a beautiful garden. Start visualizing it. Rip out magazine pictures, draw images, write down your desires. Keep your conscious mind focused on that vision and your subconscious will pave the way. It's like tending a garden. You'll pull out weeds, prune branches, fertilize and clear rocks. But the joy lies in the creation and you get to savor the fruits of your efforts. Now, the intention represents the details, but those details can be summarized in a symbol, a letter, a picture. Hold on to that symbol. Let it be the anchor for your dream house or garden. But here's the twist. Don't attach your happiness to the future realization. The thought itself is the experience. And the experience produces the emotion. Open your heart and coherence begins. Your body follows your mind and yes, it takes time. It's like tending that garden. But the joy comes from creating, evolving, and experiencing the magnificence of your own creations. Let's delve into the incredible power of broadcasting positive energy into the world. It's like sending out a signal of good vibes that can influence not just your present, but your future. Feeling gratitude with an open heart acts as the transmitter of this positive energy, reaching out into what we call the field. Picture this frequency as a magical carrier of thoughts, thoughts about your health and wealth. It's like sending a wish out into the universe and the frequency of your positive emotions becomes the magic wand that carries your dreams. However, it's crucial to note that if you're in a state of suffering, that energy won't carry the thought of your wealth. Instead, it carries a different set of thoughts associated with pain and hardship. The key here is to believe wholeheartedly in the future you're imagining. And to do that, your heart needs to be wide open. It's not just about thinking positively. It's about feeling the positivity deep within your heart. It's this heartfelt belief in your envisioned future that propels your thoughts into the universe with a force that can make things happen. Now, the challenge arises in maintaining this connection when life throws challenges your way. If you've been practicing this positive energy transmission daily with your eyes closed, the next step is opening your eyes and doing it in the moment. It's not always easy, but with awareness and effort, you can learn to self-regulate. Having a community that practices this together provides strength and support, making it easier for you to choose the future over lingering emotions from the past. Now let's talk about what I like to call reality producing machines. That's you and me, every individual on this planet. We all have the power to create our reality, but there's a shift that happens in our lives. We transition from learning to feeling, and that transition plays a significant role in shaping our experiences. Using feelings as a guide for the unknown is tricky because feelings are often tied to past experiences. It's like relying on an old map 
when you're trying to explore a new territory. Sometimes those old feelings limit us from embracing the new, and that's where the challenge lies. Our existence is shaped by two states of mind, creation and survival. Creation involves growth, expansion, health, love, joy, and trust. On the other hand, survival is marked by stress, imbalance, breakdown, and disease. Our brains are potent machines that can trigger a stress response just with thoughts, and if we let this imbalance become the norm, it leads to contraction and disease. Breaking free from the survival mode is crucial. It's like stepping out of a loop that keeps us stuck. Shifting to a creation mindset opens up a world of possibilities. It's about understanding that we have the power to shape our reality by changing the way we think and feel. We're not bound by the circumstances around us. We're the architects of our own destinies. Let's talk about something that affects us all, emotional chains. These are like invisible chains that trap us in a cycle of stress and survival. It's like being stuck in a loop of negativity and breaking free from these chains is no easy task. It requires a bit of discomfort and the willingness to be okay with feeling uncomfortable. Imagine these emotional chains as powerful chemicals that can become highly addictive. They keep us in a constant state of stress, making it challenging to break free. However, breaking free is the key to discovering true self-love and joy. It's like lifting a heavy weight off your shoulders. The interesting thing is that the same energy that once fueled anger, hatred, and prejudice can transform into joy with a different spin. It's like taking a negative force and turning it into a positive one. This process is transformative, and it starts with acknowledging that you have the power to break free. Now, here's the thing. You can't rely on someone else to do this for you. It's a personal journey that requires you to push beyond what you think are your limits. Liberating your body from these trapped emotions is the key to experiencing true joy, and it's a state of being that feels completely natural. I want you to take a moment to appreciate yourself for the journey you're on. Loving yourself is a crucial part of this process. Acknowledge the fact that you've gone further than you thought you could. You've transcended limitations in your thinking, your actions, and your feelings. That's something worth celebrating. Now, let's shift our focus to the fascinating idea of how our subjective mind influences the objective world around us. Traditional physics often talks about cause and effect, something external changing something within us. But what if we flip the script and consider changing something inside us in our thoughts and feelings? Think of yourself as a reflection of your environment. As long as we let the outside world dictate how we think and feel, we're limiting ourselves. It's like being stuck in a story that we didn't even write. But what if we could change the script what if we could alter something within ourselves and, in turn, create a different reality? Breaking the cycle of being influenced solely by our environment is a game changer. It's like stepping out of a well-worn path and discovering a whole new world of possibilities. Changing something within ourselves allows us to break free from the constraints of our surroundings. So your mind is a powerful tool. It can either make you sick or lead you to a life of health, joy and abundance. Take control of your thoughts, emotions, and intentions. Dive into the creation state, break free from survival mode, and witness the incredible transformation in your life. Remember, it's never too late to control your mind and shape your reality. Everything in this physical world, and then there's energy, and that energy has a consciousness, it has an awareness, and that energy is a field of information that we are an extension of, that we have access to, and that we spend so much of our life looking outside of ourselves instead of looking inside of ourselves, and that we are really conditioned to look just for particles and matter instead of energy and information. And truly, when people reach the end of their beliefs, or they're facing crisis in their life, that's the moment they start to turn within and start to ask the bigger questions. And if you were astute enough to look at this in moments of contemplation, if you were wanting to hide God anywhere, 
it would be a good place to hide. It would be within the human being because everybody's looking outside of themselves and we look for reasons to change and regulate our emotional states. You know, we think that things and people and external things will really fulfill emotions that we're trying to change within us and that truly when we start to really investigate who we are and look to see how we do that and demystify it, I think once we start to demystify it, it can become a skill. And so Einstein was a super cool guy because he spent a lot of time inward and at 12 years old he asked himself this simple question, if I ride my bicycle at the speed of light and I turn my lamp on, I turn my headlight on, will it go on? So he thought about that question every single day of his life, every day of his life. He would go out in a boat on a lake as a child and lay on his back in the boat and look up at the sky and think about this. And he was building models of understanding. He was working his best to be able to figure out how light and energy were related. He did it for 10 years. He was possessed by the concept. And finally, he was working as a third-rate clerk in a Swiss patent office, and he was watching this man fix the roof across the way. And he just paused for a moment, and he was watching him. And the moment he was watching him, he got this incredible vision, and he understood how light and energy were related. It was a very abstract vision, and it was so abstract and so dimensional that he had to go back to school to learn the mathematics to be able to explain what he saw. And his wife, his first wife, was an amazing scientist, and she helped him with a lot of the mathematics. And so when Einstein began to figure it out, he narrowed it down to that one simple equation that E equals MC squared, you know, energy and matter related, and the currency converter is the speed of light. And so it became very interesting because when Einstein published his papers on relativity, he didn't say like, hey, this person said this and this person said this and I'm going to footnote this person. He just said, ladies and gentlemen, this is how it is. And it rocked the scientific community because he didn't really need anybody else as a reference. He had a discovery and his discovery was so unique and his brain really was wired for the understanding of light and light was the ceiling of this reality. And so Einstein and Planck started doing these really interesting experiments where they were, they were taking energy and they were putting energetic impulses into metals. And what they were looking to see is if electrons behave the same way as the very large. In other words, when an apple falls from the tree, it falls in a very specific way. It falls towards the center. It falls towards the larger body. So he reasoned, well, if we disturb electrons, and him and Planck were doing these experiments, if we disturb these electrons, then they should fall just like an apple falling from the tree towards the nucleus. It should be predictable, just like it's predictable in Newtonian physics and classical physics. Well, when they started disturbing the electrons, something very unusual happened. The electron gained energy, then it lost energy, and it gained energy, and it lost energy, and it gained energy, and it lost energy. And instead of it falling like a ball rolling down a hill, it was like a ball rolling down steps. All of a sudden, they became very aware that the subatomic world, the very tiny, didn't behave like the very large world. And so then they started to look for the electron they started to try to measure it. And everywhere they looked for it, it appeared. And when they turned their back on it, and they no longer looked to measure it, it went from a particle that collapsed, called collapsing the wave function, back into energy. Now this was a revolutionary moment, because this meant that subjective mind, your mind has an effect on the objective world. That mind and matter are somehow correlated. And truly, when people reach the end of their beliefs or they're facing crisis in their life, that's the moment they start to turn within and start to ask the bigger questions. And if you were astute enough to look at this in moments of contemplation, if you were wanting to hide God anywhere, it would be a good place to hide. It would be within the human being because everybody's looking outside of themselves and we look for reasons to change and regulate our emotional states. You know, we think that things and people and external things will really fulfill emotions that we're trying to change within us. And that truly when we start to really investigate who we are and look to see how we do that and demystify it, I think once we start to demystify it, it can become a skill 
And so Einstein was a super cool guy because he spent a lot of time inward. And at 12 years old, he asked himself this simple question. If I ride my bicycle at the speed of light, and I turn my lamp on, I turn my headlight on, will it go on? So he thought about that question every single day of his life, every day of his life. He would go out in a boat on a lake as a child and lay on his back in the boat and look up at the sky and think about this. And he was building models of understanding. He was working his best to be able to figure out how light and energy were related. He did it for 10 years. He was possessed by the concept. And finally, he was working as a third-rate clerk in a Swiss patent office, and he was watching this man fix the roof across the way. And he just paused for a moment, and he was watching him. And the moment he was watching him, he got this incredible vision, and he understood how light and energy were related. It was a very abstract vision. And it was so abstract and so dimensional that he had to go back to school to learn the mathematics to be able to explain what he saw. And his wife, his first wife, was an amazing scientist and she helped him with a lot of the mathematics. And so when Einstein began to figure it out, he narrowed it down to that one simple equation that E equals MC squared, you know, energy and matter related, and the currency converter is the speed of light. And so it became very interesting because when Einstein published his papers on relativity, he didn't say like, hey, this person said this and this person said this, and I'm going to footnote this person. He just said, ladies and gentlemen, this is how it is. And it rocked the scientific community because he didn't really need anybody else as a reference. He had a discovery and his discovery was so unique and his brain really was wired for the understanding of light and light was the ceiling of this reality. And so Einstein and Planck started doing these really interesting experiments where they were, they were taking energy and they were putting energetic impulses into metals. And what they were looking to see is if electrons behave the same way as the very large. In other words, when an apple falls from the tree, it falls in a very specific way. It falls towards the center. It falls towards the larger body. So he reasoned, well, if we disturb electrons and him and Planck were doing these experiments, if we disturb these electrons, then they should fall just like an apple falling from the tree towards the nucleus. It should be predictable, just like it's predictable in Newtonian physics and classical physics. Well, when they started disturbing the electrons, something very unusual happened. The electron gained energy, then it lost energy. And it gained energy, and it lost energy. And it gained energy, and it lost energy. And instead of it falling like a ball rolling down a hill, it was like a ball rolling down steps. All of a sudden, they became very aware that the subatomic world, the very tiny, didn't behave like the very large world. And so then they started to look for the electron. They started to try to measure it. And everywhere they looked for it, it appeared. And when they turned their back on it and they no longer looked to measure it, it went from a particle that collapsed called collapsing the wave function back into energy. Now this was a revolutionary moment because this meant that subjective mind, your mind has an effect on the objective world. That mind and matter are somehow correlated. And so this birth of quantum physics came along. And this quantum physics experiment say that you cannot do a quantum physics experiment without an observer around. In other words, a mind always has to be present because it will influence the outcome. You with me? So now that invisible field of spirit, that invisible field of information and energy, somehow you as an individual can influence the nature of reality with your mind. The same experiences produce the same emotions. Those same emotions tend to influence the way we think. And our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, and even our gene expression is equal to how we think, how we act, and how we feel and how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality, and your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. 
So then it makes sense then, if you want to create a new personal reality, a new life, you're going to have to change your personality. And you've got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You've got to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors, even how you speak. Then you have to look at the emotions that you live by every single day and decide, do these emotions belong in my future? So many people try to create a new life as the same person. In order to create a new personal reality, you've got to change your personality. So the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Thinking the same way, making the same choices, demonstrating the same actions, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. And you do that for 10 years in a row, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature because you're firing and wiring that way. And that box in the brain, that becomes our personality, becomes our identity. And by the time we're 35 years old, for the most part, we've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it as well as the mind. And that's a habit. So we have these unconscious programs of behaviors, automatic habits, redundant emotional reactions, hardwired beliefs, perceptions, attitudes that function just like a computer program. You press go and it runs automatically. So then when it comes time to change, thinking positively is going to do nothing because your body has been conditioned for the most part into a program in the past. So the thought never makes it to the body because the body's on a different program. So how do we begin to influence the body so that the thought actually produces some type of change? So think about it. If you think an unhappy thought, you're going to feel unhappy. If you think you're a failure, you're going to feel like a failure. Once you feel like a failure, you're going to think you're a failure. And people get caught in these loops of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking. And that redundancy is a conditioning process because all you need is an image or a picture or a thought and a feeling, a response, stimulus response. And so the people tend to condition their brain and body into the past. And so when it comes time to change, you got to leave that familiar territory. And any choice that you make, if you said, hey, I'm going to eat a better diet, I'm going to wake up early and work out, I'm going to do meditation, the moment you decide to do something differently, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty. You're not going to be able to predict the next moment. That means you've left your known biology and you're stepping into the unknown. Now, theoretically, that sounds great, but if the body has been conditioned into a familiar feeling, it's in the known. The moment you take it outside the familiarity, it wants to go back to where it's comfortable. So the body starts influencing the mind. And this is where people say, I want you to start your diet tomorrow. Oh, why don't you start working out this evening? You're really never gonna change. You're too tired, you have a headache. This doesn't feel right. And this is where people talk themselves out of it. Because if they respond to that thought, that thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior, creates the same experience, produces the same feeling, and then they say, this feels right. No, that feels familiar. So going from one state of mind and body to another state of mind and body, you got to cross a river. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. Now, once people understand that they're going to be uncomfortable, then the question is, what thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors will you demonstrate in one day? And the act of closing your eyes and rehearsing who you're going to be when you open your eyes begins to install neurological hardware in your brain to look like you've already done it. Now, intention is a vision, a potential that already exists in the quantum field that you get to select. And when you ask yourself a question like, what would it be like to be healthy? What would it be like to be wealthy? What would it be like to be free or to be in love? The moment you ask that creative question, a part of your brain called the frontal lobe turns on. That's the crowning achievement of the human being. Once that area of the brain turns on, it's like a great symphony leader. It looks out of the landscape of the entire brain and it begins to randomly select different networks of neurons that are connected to the things you've learned in your life or the experiences you've had. 
and it begins to seamlessly paste them together to create an ideal, a vision, or an internal representation. That is a potential experience that's awaiting you. But it's not enough to just have the mind involved. Thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates a state of being. Once you can begin to emotionally embrace that future reality before it's made manifest, when you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, the freedom, the joy, the inspiration, the genuine love that you feel or gratitude from that experience, the moment you do that, your body as the unconscious mind begins to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment. Now you're moving into a new state of being, into a new personality, and a new personality creates a new personal reality. The research that we've done shows that when we teach people how to regulate their internal states to begin to create more coherence in their brain and to generate elevated emotions like joy and gratitude and inspiration, that not only does the brain become coherent, but so does the heart. And when the brain is coherent, the heart is coherent. When the heart is coherent, the brain is coherent. And so why don't we live by these states on a daily basis? Primarily because the majority of the time that we live in our waking state of consciousness, 70% of the time, you and I are living by the hormones of stress. And living in stress is living in survival. And when you're living in survival, the very chemicals of survival cause you to function as materialist, defining your reality with your senses. You pay attention to objects and things and people. You begin to believe that your outer world is more real than your inner world. And the side effect of this over time begins to cause us to feel separate from possibility. Why? Because when you're threatened by some predator or some danger in your life, it's not a time to go in. It's not a time to trust the unknown. It's not a time to open your heart and feel love. It's not a time to communicate. It's not a time to create. It's not a time to learn. It's a time to survive. So then, in order for us to create, we have to lay down the very thing we used our whole life to get what we want for something greater to occur. And most importantly, we want you to understand when you're in the creative state and when you're not. And if you were to take a little time every day and apply some of the principles and changing beliefs and perceptions about yourself and your life, and what is a belief other than a thought you keep thinking over and over again? And all beliefs are based on past experiences. And in order for you to change a belief or perception about yourself and your life, you have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in your brain and the emotional conditioning in your body. And your body literally has to respond to a new mind. And when the choice becomes an experience that you never forget, that's the moment the past biologically no longer exists in you. People use the word victim so much, and I don't really think we spend a lot of time really unraveling the idea. But if I said to you, Jay, how are you doing today? And you said, well, I'm really upset because of this person or this circumstance or this condition in my life, then what we're saying, this is not conscious. This is an unconscious program. What we're saying is somebody out there is actually controlling the way I'm feeling and the way that I'm thinking. So if something out there is controlling your feelings and your thoughts, you're victim to whoever, whatever that is. Now here's the challenge. The challenge is when things go really well, then you are feeling really good. But when things aren't going very well, then you're feeling pretty bad. You begin to become conscious of your unconscious actions or habits or behaviors and modify them. And then we have to begin to look at the emotions that we live by every single day that keep us connected to the past and decide, do these emotions belong in our future? So most people are trying to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. 
you literally have to become someone else. And can you select a new possibility in the quantum field and begin to emotionally embrace that future every single day to such a degree that your body, as the unconscious mind, the objective mind, does not know the difference between the experience in your life that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone to the degree that you begin to signal new genes and new ways to change your body to look like the experience has already happened. Now, the latest research in epigenetics says it's absolutely possible. This every day, installing the circuitry every day, conditioning the body into the emotion of the future, that your body begins to change to look like it's already happened. Now this is where it gets fun, because now you no longer have to go anywhere to get it. If you think that your thoughts have something to do with your future, just from a theoretical standpoint, that your thoughts create your destiny, and you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, well, then your life isn't gonna change very much as long as you're thinking the same way. If you're not being defined by a vision of the future, then you're left with the memories of the past. Is it possible then that the way you think and the way you feel can begin to produce effects in your outer world? Now, that isn't something that you swallow in one bite. It's a process of gaining knowledge. It's a process of practice. It's a process of experience. But once you start seeing those synchronicities, those coincidences, those opportunities, that start to fall into place because you're experiencing change in your outer world. If you're doing the work, you're going to start paying attention to what you're doing inside of you that's producing the effect outside of you. And once you correlate the changes of what you're doing inside of you with the effect you produce outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again. And all of a sudden, you're going to start believing more that you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. And those same thoughts lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the exact same experiences, and we anticipate the same feelings or emotions from those experiences.